hear me? Yes, we're nice. in business. Everyone, here's okay. Llewellyn. <laughs> awesome. Now let's see if the screen sharing works. Yes. All right, can everyone see that? Awesome. All right. So is uh, is Benjamin and April in the panel? There we go. Hello. Yes. Awesome. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Llewellyn Marshall. I'm an administrator and application developer for the State Library of North Carolina's NC Cardinal program. We're so happy to be here virtually at another Evergreen conference. And we hope that we'll be able to see y'all in person at the conference in 2022. This is my second Evergreen conference, but this is the first time that I've presented here. Today, I'll be talking to y'all about the triumphs and challenges the State Library has had facilitating interlibrary loans and how our processes could be improved as our consortium grows to include more and more of our big and beautiful state. There are two parts to my presentation, a logistics-focused geographic overview of the areas that Cardinal serves and an outline of how the geolocation services in Evergreen could be expanded to improve the whole targeting process for resource sharing. NC Cardinal is a statewide consortium started in 2011 and incorporates the public libraries of 55 of North Carolina's 100 counties. Each year, the Cardinal team and our associates Mobius bring new counties on board by migrating them from their existing ILS into Evergreen. Some of the counties already existed within regional library systems, such as Sand Hill Regional or Appalachian Regional. The counties from these systems were migrated into the consortium all at once and still maintain their structure and branding. The counties in NC Cardinal represent a wealth of diversity, both in patrons and environments, from the mountainous west to the sun-bleached beaches of the east. By the end of 2020, the number of active patrons was approximately 2.2 million people. Using 2019 census estimate data, that means up to 21% of the population of North Carolina has an account in our consortium. While most consortium members are rural or suburban areas, our three largest consortium members, Buncombe, Forsyth, and Cumberland, contain the larger cities of Asheville, Winston-Salem, and Fayetteville. Most of Cardinal's patrons are in the central and western regions of the state, where most of North Carolina's population is concentrated. After a two-month period, systems newly brought into the consortium begin to exchange material with other libraries across the state. This is a very popular benefit of joining NC Cardinal especially for small or rural libraries that don't have the same access to materials that larger libraries have. Over time, resource sharing has come to represent the majority of all holds placed in our system. Our resource sharing numbers were lower in 2020 because many of our members temporarily shut their doors due to the coronavirus pandemic. Each library system in our consortium has a shipping hub where resource sharing materials are delivered to. This is usually the main branch of the library system, but not always. Some municipal libraries share shipping hubs with their neighbors. When an interlibrary loan is placed, library staff need to go onto our NC Cardinal knowledge book to determine which shipping hub belongs to the courier code found on their hold transit slip. The state covers the cost of shipping items between library shipping hubs, but local governments handle the cost of transit between their shipping hub and their branches. As our consortium now stretches from the westernmost edge of North Carolina to the easternmost edge, the unique geography of North Carolina has begun to create challenges for resource sharing. Let's go into a geography lesson to help explain why. At 503 miles across, North Carolina is quite a long state. It can take up to nine hours to drive from one end to the other. As y'all can probably imagine, it saves a lot of time and money when material ships 100 miles instead of 500. In addition to the length of the state, there's a huge elevation difference between the western end of the state and the eastern end. I like to imagine the state as a 500 mile ramp. The top of the ramp is the Appalachian Mountains at 6,000 feet, and the bottom is the Atlantic Ocean at sea level. The state is typically divided into four environments, the mountains, the Piedmont Sandhills, the coastal plains, and the outer banks. Because Cardinal administers libraries in each of these environments, 
we've become well-versed in the challenges that each provides. Western North Carolina is home to the Appalachian Mountains, sometimes referred to as the Eastern Continental Divide. Mount Mitchell, located in recently migrated Yancey County, is the tallest mountain on the East Coast at 6,684 feet. Buncombe County is our largest consortium member in this region and our largest consortium member overall with 193,000 active patrons. It's not switching to the next slide. There we go. The jagged cliffs, steep slopes, and winding gravel roads can make shipping to this part of the state a lengthy process. On the right, y'all can see that even major roads like Interstate 40 have to weave around the hills when using dynamite or tunneling wasn't possible. One time on a trip to Nashville, I drove on this part of 40 in a massive SUV and struggled to stay between the concrete barrier and the rock wall. Imagine doing that in a huge delivery vehicle if you get into an accident, there's no place to pull over. There are also frequently rock slides that can completely cut off regions from one another. For instance, on another trip I did, what should have been a two hour drive from Asheville to Boone turned into a five hour drive because the highway had a mudslide. On the left, you can see Highway 321 leaving Boone. This road isn't as winding as I-40 because it's headed east here instead of west. What you get instead is a massive grade as you change elevation from the mountains into the Piedmont. It's easy to end up going 80 miles per hour without even touching the gas pedal. Even if you don't wanna, you can't go slowly because the road is so steep that you'll ruin your brakes. All along the highway are sandy ramps where runaway trucks can somewhat safely come to a smashing halt. Let's see if this loads. There we go. Here's a little bonus video of a truck using one of these runaway ramps in the Appalachian Mountains. This happened in West Virginia on a road with a 7.5% grade. You can see that the grade was too much for the truck's brakes, and they started to smoke like crazy before the truck veered off into the ramp. This is a good example where no one got hurt, but on the right, you can see there are much rougher videos online, but I'll leave it up to y'all to find those. I don't even want to think about taking a bookmobile on one of those ramps. Central North Carolina is divided into two environments. The northwestern portion is called the Piedmont and features densely sloping clay hills and the occasional mountain. The Piedmont is the most urbanized region of the state, containing eight of the 10 largest cities in NC. This region contains NC Cardinal's second most populous member, Forsyth County, with 177,000 active patrons. Forsyth receives the largest number of resource sharing holds. The southeastern portion of this region is called the Sand Hills. It's a relatively flatter region than the Piedmont, featuring pine-covered sand dunes with abundant lakes, swamps, and rivers. Cumberland County, home to Fort Bragg and the neighboring city of Fayetteville, is our third largest consortium member with 144,000 active patrons. There seems to be not nearly as many logistical challenges for Central NC than at the mountains or the coast. Other than traffic jams, derailed trains, and the occasional tornado, the gentler slopes and access to ample highways and interstates make Central North Carolina the least complicated area for shipping. But if there are any folks from the Piedmont here in the chat, I'd love to hear if y'all have any unique resource sharing challenges. We have a little break coming up where we could chat. Eastern North Carolina is called the Coastal Plain. It's a very flat, sandy area dominated by rivers, swamps, bays, and giant lakes. The largest member of our consortium from this region is Noose Regional Library with 56,000 active patrons. This region is also home to the massive marine base Camp Lejeune in recently migrated Anzo County. With all the water and low-lying ground in this region, it's frequently the target of flooding and massive storm systems. During these times, even major roads can become inaccessible for weeks. Are these the lush banks of the Mississippi River? Nope, it's just I-40 after Hurricane Florence in 2018. Messes like these take months to fully clean up. Some poorer areas still haven't recovered. Hurricanes and severe weather are a constant concern for NC during the hurricane season. It's likely that climate change is making hurricane season stronger and longer than ever before. The locals learned to live with this by lifting their houses up on stilts and blocks, but infrastructure take much longer to repair and adapt. When shipping essential items becomes a logistical nightmare, 
You know y'all's David Baldacci books aren't going anywhere without a canoe. East of the plains across the intercoastal waterway are a 200 mile long string of barrier islands known as the Outer Banks. Although frequently thought of as a vacation destination for the folks of Central and Sea, there are populations of people who live on the islands year round and need access to libraries. Some of these islands are so far away that they can't be seen from the mainland and you can only get to them by boat. One of our libraries in this region, Ocracoke Community Library, is almost 30 miles away from the mainland United States. I have more on them next. The NCDOT operates a ferry service to take these vehicles between the mainland and the Outer Banks. BHM Regional Library has a fellow who takes that ferry out to Ocracoke to deliver material to the community library. It's about a two or three hour long ride. It sounds like a sweet job, but it's not always. The sea is a rough mistress, and even a small storm can turn a peaceful ferry ride into the boat scene from Willy Wonka. I hope they have those David Baldacci books in a Ziploc bag. A while back, the Cardinal team played around with a code branch where holdings in the staff client were sorted by physical distance to the patron's home OU. That code has since been included with the Evergreen 3.70. This branch included longitude and latitude for library branches and used an as the crow flies distance between libraries. Due to the many mountains and islands of North Carolina, as the crow flies doesn't tell the whole story. We're built different. We need a as the cardinal flies distance. The map on the left shows the scenario I just described. Even though Bogue Banks, and don't call it Bougie Banks, is only 55 miles away from Ocracoke Island, going up and down the coastline adds another 14 miles. And using the ferry brings the total travel time up to three hours and 41 minutes. In the example on the right, Driving between Swannanoa and Fairview Public Libraries is about three times the distance as the As the Crow Flies because of the 4,200 foot tall mountain in between the two. This concludes the geography portion of our presentation. I'll stop bombarding y'all with maps and scenic photos, I promise. Before we go on to the technical side of our presentation, I'd like to take a few moments to open the floor to y'all for any questions or comments. I see there's a bunch of activity in the chat. Yeah, so far we've had uh, questions about how long um, libraries uh, wait before they start to resource share, and they have up to two months for that. Um, the other question was about uh, how many days a week do does uh, UPS pick up, um, and it's basically up to the libraries. We have a state contract that we do with UPS, um, and so it really depends on the volume. Um, if there is a lot of um, traffic, then they can choose to have five pickups a week. Um, let's see here. Other questions. Your pals in PA Appalachia fully respect the fact that every travel requires crossing mountains and rivers just to get groceries. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I have a few questions for the chat. I'm curious to hear if y'all have had any logistical problems when it comes to geography or climate where y'all are at. Barb says 30 inches of snow in a night. I don't think I've seen 30 inches of snow my whole life put together. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of a lot of snow. That, yeah, that is not too big of a concern in North Carolina, except in parts of the mountains that are really high elevation. They get snow pretty frequently in the fall and winter. Island libraries in the far north require the use of ferries, wind sleds, and ice roads. That's cool. I never thought about an ice road for logistical purposes for libraries. That's cool. So I'm guessing, is that, uh, is that like in, in Canada or Alaska maybe? We use one big shipping hub for 13 libraries. Oh, 
Okay, far northern Wisconsin on Lake Superior. That's cool. It's always fun hearing like a diverse set of a uh, set of thoughts here. Let's see, I have another question. How often do y'all retarget holds because the pickup library is too far away? So we have a never, never. Retarget happens more because of lack of open hours. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure, especially due to COVID, there's been a lot of changes in what hours people are open. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the second part of the presentation. So although Evergreen 3.7 includes the code for sorting holdings by geographic distance, the whole targeter isn't taking any of these issues I've been talking about into consideration when looking for a target copy to fulfill a hold. Instead, target copies are broken down by their proximity to the target library, and proximity has nothing to do with miles or feet. It represents the difference in the org unit tree between two libraries. Target copies at the pickup library will have a proximity of zero, and copies at the pickup library siblings will have a proximity of one. Copies from another system within the consortium have a proximity of three or greater. For each level of proximity that the whole targeter is looking through, it will randomly choose a copy to look at. If the targeter, the targeter runs a process that determines whether the copy can be held, and during this process, it finds the hold policy that should apply. This hold policy could prevent copies from being selected if the proximity is too high. If that copy looks good to place a hold on, the process is finished, and the hold will target that copy. While this works great for selecting local holds, with the size of our consortium and the physical distance between libraries, selecting target copies randomly has a high chance of picking one that could be an issue to ship. We're aware that using proximity adjustments could be a way to simulate physical distance. With 100 and, over 160 libraries, entering in proximity adjustments between all of them would be a huge undertaking. And this process only gets more difficult as we add more libraries. Such a long and tedious process is a great candidate for automation. We believe that focusing the community's attention on improving the interlibrary hold targeting could help to save money, save fuel, and scale Evergreen up for large consortiums like ours or even larger. So we began thinking of ways that our shipping process could be represented in the source code of Evergreen. We've been working on a proof of concept code branch off of at Cardinal's current version of Evergreen 354. Our branch introduces geolocation features to the core source code. Just like the holding sort feature, we use the database to store longitude and latitude for library addresses. What our branch does different is to represent our concept of the shipping hub and to store the physical distance between each hub. Because the term proximity was already used in the system, we chose to use the word vicinity to represent these physical distances. Inside the vicinity calculator, these three values can be calculated by an external application programming interface, API, or entered in manually using new Angular interfaces that we've created. These values are used to create the vicinity matrix inside of the hold targeter. Similar to the proximity matrix, this new data structure contains the physical distance between the pickup library and the shipping hub of each of the target copy circlips. The API uses driving directions for these calculations to get the most accurate representation of how long it could take to deliver. This information is used to sort the target copy array so that material that is physically closer to the pickup library will be chosen before those that are farther away. The first thing we had to do was set up a connection to a geolocation API. We chose to use Bing because it was free, easy to use with Perl, and the state library pretty much uses Microsoft for everything already. 
Once the account was set up, we registered our application with Bing to get our API key. There are different types of application available. And make sure you don't do what I did and choose an application type that limits how many times you can use it. With all the testing I was doing, I managed to exceed that limit pretty quickly. The application I had selected was dev test, which lets you use it an unlimited number of times a day until you hit a fixed limit, and then you can't use that key anymore. The second one I ended up setting up was the basic Windows application type. You can use that one a limited number of times per day, but an unlimited number of times per key. We set up the vicinity calculator in the OpenSurf.xml config file. This is where I put my API key from Bing Maps. This is something that the holdings sort in 3.7 does a lot better. I really prefer how the geolocation services are abstracted and represented in the database. But this works all right for our proof of concept. From the org unit editor, we can set the shipping hub for an org unit to be any other org unit, regardless of library system. We did this because, as mentioned earlier, some municipal libraries share their shipping hub with neighboring library systems. Each shipping hub must have the longitude and latitude set up on their mailing addresses so that the API can calculate driving routes between them. The new interface allows the admin to manually enter the coordinates of an org unit or use the API to retrieve that information using the mailing address. Once that information has been entered, patrons can see a map of the area and open a link to get directions to the library. If you've used these features in 3.7, they should look very familiar. There's the map. So that's pretty cool. Just like how the actor org unit proximity table works, actor org unit shipping hub distance is the database table that stores the physical distance between org units. In this Angular interface, we can view and modify the distances. Using the Calculate button, we can use Bing Maps to automatically calculate the distances using driving directions. Clicking the Calculate button will clear out the entire table before entering in values from the API. Now that we've gone over the changes to the database, let's talk about the changes we've made to the Perl code. The whole targeter will function as normal for the first two levels of proximity. These are typically the pickup library and the pickup library system. This is because we assumed that the org units at these levels will be using the same shipping hub as the pickup library. For that reason, we also chose not to include vicinity in the action hold copy map, because we were worried that there would be additional overhead for local holds. Once it's determined that there are no copies available locally, the hold targeter will calculate a vicinity matrix for each copy at each level of proximity above two. As mentioned earlier, the vicinity matrix is a hash containing the physical distance between the pickup library and each unique shipping hub in the target copy array. The hold targeter will sort the potential copies so that the closest to the pickup library are brought to the top of the queue. The team has set up two ways to test and track these new features that we've been working on. On our branch, we've updated the Concerto database so that the standard org units have longitude, latitude, and real mailing addresses. We created an automated test that places a hold and uses the shipping hub distance table to find out which copy has the shortest distance to the pickup library and ensures that the copy that's chosen has the shortest distance. We've also been working on several functions and a table to monitor our holds in NC Cardinal. They can get pretty complex to understand. We created a hold audit table that records extra information about holds than a standard audit table would. The audit includes the hold matrix match point, the proximity of the target copy, the minimum proximity of all eligible copies, and the number of eligible copies. These data points are captured in the extras table whenever a hold is updated. We need to record this information at the moment a hold is updated because the hold match points and eligible copies are in constant flux as folks across the state use the system. With these new geolocation features, the target and minimum physical distance could be recorded in the audit as well, so we can verify that the nearest copies are being selected. One of the functions we've cooked up to debug holds lets us see each hold policy that matched with a hold and why. When there's more than one hold policy to match, 
there's a calculation that runs behind the scenes to give them a score. Each category of the score matches up with a part of the hold. Like if the hold policy says it applies to Farmville Library, target copies from Farmville Library will have a higher score in that category. The policy with the highest score gets picked, and that determines whether a copy can be held or not. All you got to do is put a hold ID in, and the function does the rest. Too far. There are a few additional concerns to think about with resource sharing. We're hoping that Evergreen Community could help us come up with something for these problems. At the top of the list is zip code surcharges. Shipping surcharges are applied by UPS when delivering to zip codes that are less accessible or have a low population. We'd like to include this information into the hold targeter, but are unsure of how to represent that information or keep it up to date efficiently. Due to the variables at play, such as the cost of fuel, efficiency of delivery vehicles, and the condition of the road, it could be hard to decide whether to eat the cost of the surcharge or to ship a farther distance. One idea we've had was to tack on an additional number of miles to each shipping hub distance if the surcharge was applied. But we didn't like the idea of distorting the data that comes out of the API, nor would it be realistic to have this be a fixed number given the variables I just mentioned. Earlier in the presentation, I talked about how weather events and mudslides could cut off access to vital highways. Modern map services have gotten pretty good at recalculating routes to avoid highway closures. How frequently should Evergreen recalculate driving routes to ensure that material is avoiding problem areas? Should that frequency be increased during hurricane season? Another concern is the use of other geolocation services. Currently, our proof of concept is only compatible with Bing Maps because it's free and easy to use with Perl. But next, we'll rebase our code with the latest version of Evergreen and use the geolocation services classes included to expand our tools and make the features more scalable. Shortly, this will be released onto a collaboration branch. Another problem that could come up is that a library system that is easily accessible and has a large inventory of books like Winston-Salem could get repeatedly targeted for holds by its smaller neighbors in a way that could put a lot of burden on them. If they went to retarget the hold, it should target the next closest copy available. But if that library also retargets the hold, would it be back on Winston-Salem again? Right now, the randomness of the hold targeter can help to prevent a system from being too responsible for holds. How can we replicate that kind of behavior following our modifications to the hold targeter? Lastly, We've thought about the potential for including a new parameter on hold policies similar to the transit range that could prevent materials from traveling more than a certain number of miles away. This could be helpful for fragile materials or for kits. Are there any other ways that we can introduce the concept of vicinity to hold policies? That's all we have for you today. Now we'd like to turn it over to the audience for any questions, comments, or concerns. I've been seeing lots of stuff coming up in the chat. So one of the questions I uh, Scott uh, Peterson was posing was, um, does this system account for processing time at the library as opposed to how long it's with UPS? Um, I thought that might be something you may want to comment on. I said that the system is looking primarily at truck shipping distance rather than time specifically. Yeah, it's it's only looking at distance right now, but I have thought about like what if it was based more on time because then it would kind of help solve that the whole ferry problem where it takes, you know, hours to wait for a ferry and that might be useful to know, you know, going into a, placing a hold. One of the queries I ran at the beginning of this process was looking at the average shipping time between any two branches in the system, so sometimes you know, the branch may be a hub to hub, and so it's rather quick. And other times it may be, you know, this branch getting to its hub, then that hub to that hub, and then that hub to that branch. And the longest is 14 on average um, from a certain branch to branch, and others is as short as like two days. But in general, we're not really looking at time more so, just the distance. Scott also asked a question um, about. Uh, how libraries track the individual items in a shipment. And so um, some libraries use spreadsheets to track those individual items that they're sending. Um, there have occasionally been situations where a box gets wet or 
damaged in transit. And so that helps them uh, build the claim with uh, UPS. And I think it's Forsyth who created a nice uh, form that they use to record the um, tracking number from the tracking label as well as the barcodes. Uh, they have like a Google form where they track all yeah. that stuff. Jennifer, I think, was uh, part of the development. Jennifer Weston? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Jonathan Burr. They I like presented... Blake's idea here in the chat of uh, using the, uh, the hold transit data to inform the hold targeter. That's a cool idea. But then you got you to gotta get some, some bad holds first. <laughs> So Scott's asking, has your real world experience matched up with the shipping time predictions? And do you have a quality control to make sure times stay correct? I would say we don't really have predictions in the sense of um, it's more what's kind of normal rather than um, sort of what we expect it to be. Um, the, the thing that Llewellyn was showing about the table, um, where it's sort of tracking the life, uh, uh, the history of an individual, um, hold, uh, request, um, you know, if, if for instance, it is targeted to a certain item and then it's targeted to another item and then it's targeted to another item, um, that's really more what we have, uh, it, which what can be a quality control thing to see if, for instance, um, certain places just aren't filling holes. Well, another thoughts on that? Hmm. See, I'm not really sure. So, you're you're more in charge of the the resource sharing stuff. I mean, once once you hand it over to UPS, do they give you the like tracking number that you can go out and check on it later? Not, I mean, they. We can go into the system and do that. We we really haven't had a need to do that. Really, it's more if something gets lost, um, which we've had very few instances of, you know, damaged books or the, or that sort of thing. So we generally are not watching the tracking numbers. We're just sort of jumping in when there's a problem, um, and then we do some statistics on the tail end to see how long did it take between the time where the hold was captured and the time where it was checked in on the check-in shelf. Um, but other than that, we're not sort of actively monitoring the UPS traffic. Got a bunch of other. Yeah, Robert posted that um, they did have a box disappear and the damage was capped at $100 um, if there wasn't a price included uh, at the original shipment. And we have chosen not to do additional um, insurance because that would um, it, it significantly increase the cost of this and so um that is one of the um that is one of the potential risks has and this reduced the aggregate average transit time for hold filling transits that seems like a good measure of efficiency um do you mean this new software or these this new development work or um or something I guess we don't know yet. We haven't really thrown yeah. much at this in the real world. This is a this is just a proof of concept right now, but it's something that we're looking at. You know, getting into the latest version of Evergreen that would, you know, we would use once that's uh, available. But Mike, to your point, and to Scott, um, but I think yeah, that's that's one of the things that as we sort of, you know, turn this on. Um, for us and kind of look at the impact of it, um, you know, this is, that's where we want to see what is the real impact of this and how do we need to configure our hold policies and, you know, it's, it's, that's basically our big project in, in the coming year is just sort of looking at our hold configurations from top to bottom, including this sort of thing. And then, of course, running the stats and seeing how long did this take and how much of an improvement and how do we tweak it and all that kind of fun stuff. I can say I'm personally very excited to incorporate some of the things that uh, was in your was in your presentation uh, yesterday, Mike. So, 
And the Welland, we've had several votes for you to do a follow-up session next year. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> There's no way to bend the routes around UPS hubs, is there? I'm not sure if I understand that. Is that like an airbender reference? Robert, I don't know if you want to clarify what you what your question is there. I'm uh, I'm interested in what Diana is talking about with uh, like did you do proximity adjustments between your branches? How many branches do you have? I think Robert's talking about um, UP, UPS uh, warehouse type hubs, not the not our hubs. That makes sense. So John is suggesting um, once you have enough data, I wonder if it would be possible to write a script or something similar to track the average transit time between branches and then have that update the proximity adjustment between branches automatically it would then theoretically get more accurate the more it is used. Sounds like artificial intelligence to me. That's sort of like what Blake was just talking about too. So Mike is saying MEC has modeled shipping hubs using proximity adjustments. So how, how sustainable do y'all think that is? Like, is it something that's hard to keep updated? To Donna's, uh suggestion that that they've had success with uh, a second check-in process yeah it, i think it's a good idea and it's something we recommend to libraries that um, they check in um, before items are sent out from a hub and also before items uh, as as items are received at the hub just to make sure that they're still destined to go to their their end branch so a few more check-ins are always helpful Recently, we had a ticket where someone was asking about why um, something was available for hold and the patron got notified, um, but then it wasn't on the shelf yet. And what had happened was the item was checked in, they read the spine label and sent it to that library when it should have held at that local library. It went there and then bounced back the next day and yeah. was available not, for hold. So not fun things like that. Yeah. <laughs> So Scott is asking, what hasn't worked or proven to be a problem? Um, are, uh, Scott, are you referring to Diane's uh, things with proximity adjustments or um, to the work that Llewellyn has been doing? Okay, so I guess if that's a question about the uh, the code I've been working on, one thing that kind of throws a wrench in things is how the uh, mailing address is formatted. And I don't know if this is a problem with Bing Maps, and it's not something that you'd get if you use Google, but um, you know, it, it frequently will pick something that's just totally wrong, and you know, you don't really know until you go to that that contact page I showed in the demo and, and see like, oh, this is in a totally different state. But if it's sometimes if it's like, you know, if it's like two Broadway street or something, it's like, oh, Broadway, New York, right. When it's really, you know, Broadway in Durham, North Carolina or something.
Sharon has a question about um, how we're physically delivering. Um, happy to answer that one. Um, so essentially, the state library through their uh, through our state library contract um, pays for the distribution between the 34 hubs throughout the system. So each library system has a hub. So that can be, for instance, Sand Hill Regional Library, which has 18 different entities, organizational units, five different counties. That's one library system and it has one hub. Um, then we have places like Mooney um, uh, Memorial Library in Kings Mountain. It's a municipal library, single library, single branch. It is a hub. Um, and so basically we will pay for the shipping between those two entities and then um, Sand Hill, for instance, has to have a courier that will run between its branches and drop off materials that are being coming that are coming from other library systems and collect materials that have been picked up um, for picking off the shelf and brought to the hub um, you know shelved up and then put into boxes for um, UPS UPS comes and takes those off to the other hubs where rinse and repeat so essentially yeah it's just we we have a limited number of points rather than like a courier system where it's it's sort of you know, doing the route and it's kind of working um, all over the place. Okay, so you're saying similar to your courier that runs from system headquarters, to system headquarters. So that's one of the impacts, you know, when when new library system joins, especially if it's a regional system, that's, you know, it's going to take more work. Um, and that's part of the, you know, the sharing aspect of it. Um, but uh, yeah. I think we're just about at, at time, aren't we? Nice work, work Llewellyn. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, hope you all liked my David Baldacci jokes. You've got lots of LOLs in the chat, Llewellyn. <laughs> this was wonderful. I enjoyed because, you know, I'm a North Carolina girl too, so this is been a lot of fun for me so thank you it was excellent very well done thank you bye everybody take care